Good evening. My name is Marcus Cole. I'm the Director of Operations for Maths Youth Soccer. We're excited to welcome you here to our webinar this evening on de-escalation. Uh, we think it's a really important topic that we want to discuss uh, with our members and give them opportunity to learn more about de-escalating, maybe a sideline situation, what have you uh, at an event, whether it's a field marshal, uh, an administrator, or anything, referee um, uh, can work as well. Um, and we're just excited to have Christina Kramer, a mental performance coach of Kramer Performance Consulting with us uh, to uh, kind of run down some things to think about, as well as some practical tools for you to put in your toolbox. Uh, so the next time that you're out on the fields and you have a situation arise, that you'll be able to better handle it properly. So want to welcome Christine. Thank you for being a part of this webinar. Thanks, Marcus. I'm really excited to be here. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, let uh, Christina uh, tell you a little bit about herself and get into her presentation. Perfect. Yeah, let me get this screen shared for us. All right. Oh, and one thing I do want to mention, we will be doing a QA and a uh, after this session. So if you do have a question, there is a box at the bottom of your screen, Q&A. Feel free to go ahead and put it in anytime. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and uh, answer those questions. Uh, Christina will be able to do that for you. So thank you very much, Christina. Go right ahead. Okay. Yeah, so uh, like you said, I'm a mental performance coach. I'm also currently a doctoral candidate um, in sport and performance psychology. I am just a few months out from defending and hopefully becoming doctor, Christina Kramer. Um, in, in this space, um, I do have a background in um, both officials management on the recreation side, and then I used to be um, an NCAA volleyball coach. So while not specifically to soccer, I have been adjacent to that season and have spent a lot of time on the sidelines in youth sports. So I understand from a parent perspective and from a coach perspective, some of the stressors that you all have gone through. Um, I am also currently a cognitive performance specialist uh, contracted with the U.S. military. So um, some of the ways that I like to frame sports, especially when I'm talking to parents, is, hey, it might feel like life and death, but we have experience around people who actually deal with stressors that are life and death, and we want to try to make youth sports high school sport and college sport a little bit more fun again for both the player, the coach, and the official. So hopefully I can give you some tactics to do that for yourself, even if you are facing a lot of conflict um, inside your workspace, whether it be the whole facility or on your field specifically. So the goal for today, the first is just to understand the stress cycle and how it impacts conflict, emotions, and decision-making. I feel that understanding the stress cycle for us personally will help us not meet conflict with more conflict. Um, unfortunately, there's gonna be a lot of times that we might not be able to prevent this escalation or the stress that uh, parents may place on you. It's more, how can we better manage it so our response is better, our decision-making and cognitive awareness is gonna be sharper. And at the end of the day, we don't take those things personally and can frame it properly for our own well-being and enjoyment. At the end of the day, we want officials to stay officiating in sport. And um, while we'll ask parents to be less stress-inducing for us, uh, we're going to be human, we're going to make errors, and we're probably going to end up feeling stressed at some point in our job. And we want to make sure that we know how to manage that for ourselves um, when we're facing those difficult conflicts. And then second, uh, as Marcus said, we want to add tools to your toolkit to just personally navigate situations that require de-escalation. Obviously, we want to refer you to whatever your protocols are within your program, um, how you report certain situations that maybe it's not just about you and whatever's happening on the sidelines, or just about you and maybe the coach or player that we are having a difficulty with. But having just some extra tools in your own toolkit to maybe respond in a little bit better manner that you feel really confident, no matter how bad the situation gets, you um, are able to navigate it with a little more ease. And in addition to that, you can 
um, hopefully create a better environment for those around the situation. Because at the end of the day, um, the greater percentage of people that are not frustrated or upset are going to really recognize your ability to deal with conflict. They're going to recognize your ability to deal with tough individuals, and they are going to see the benefit in utilizing your services and utilizing you as an official and utilizing your facilities for tournaments as well. So the first thing, what is stress, right? Stress is the uh, body's physical and emotional response to a presented stressor. Um, and secondly, it's an expected part of sport. I tell a lot of people that I work with, the first error we make in stress management is we think we can avoid it. And at the end of the day, there's no avoiding stress when we are in sport. Um, intentionally, we seek out stressful situations as athletes, as coaches, and as officials, because stress isn't always bad. And so we want to make sure that we are recognizing that what our body does to respond to stressors present is a correct mechanism that has been ingrained in our body for, for centuries, right? So back in the day, if we had to hunt for our food and there was a threat in front of us, we wanted to make sure our body would recognize that stressor and alert us, right? That's where that fight or flight comes from. And nowadays, right, we go to a grocery store and so we don't have that same fight or flight mechanism when it comes to real threats on a regular basis, but our body is still wired to feel that way. And so a parent screaming from the stands the entire game, an altercation occurring that you have to manage, those things are going to uh, enhance a feeling within us that is, hmm, this might be stressful, this might be a threat to us, or it might be a threat to those around us. So we first just want to acknowledge that stress is expected and it's also the feeling we're getting. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is our body and mind functioning in the way it's supposed to. So what we want to do is recognize what is going on inside our body and how can we respond to it a little bit more appropriately. So this is a very basic version of what is happening for you in the stress cycle. So first you have that stressor. What is the stressor? The parent. Um, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's the coach of a team, maybe it's the entire team. It could be someone that we've asked to leave the facility and refuses to, right? It can be as basic as hearing chirping all game long or as severe as maybe we need to call the authorities. A stressor can range from a lot of different things. So then the second step is that perception and the perception we'll talk about a little bit in a second, but you may perceive something to be stressful that maybe uh, someone else on the field does not perceive it to be stressful at all. This is where communication within your teams and within um, whoever is assigned to different fields and games, understanding how each other respond to different situations is important. So we can know, okay, these things are really stressful to me. I can lean on Marcus to deal with this because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, draw that physical stressor out of him in the way it does me. Then you get to, after the perception, our stress response. We'll talk about this as well. Physical and psychological responses occur, sometimes both. Physical, of course, is that stress in our body, tension and being aggressive, um, maybe feeling as though we have butterflies in our stomach or not. Psychological is gonna be maybe that self-talk, maybe we start believing the things they're saying or we ruminate on it later and we're not able to move past um, what is happening. And then based on that stress response is how we cope, both adaptively, good, proper stress regulation techniques, or maladaptively, lashing out, yelling and screaming, maybe hitting, um, hopefully not physically, hitting your um, aggressive behaviors that are coming towards you, matching that with the same feeling. Um, this is also good to know of, this is probably what's occurring when someone else is acting out they have gone through this stress cycle. They might perceive something to be a threat. Their kid has a bad game and they're taking it out on the ref. They are embarrassed that they are being asked to leave. So they perceive that as a threat. Um, and you can probably come up with a hundred other examples to where this loop kind of stays active and we can't get out of it. So some basic examples for you all, referee abuse. We wanna keep an eye on that as a stressor that may trigger someone else, but also us if we have to deal with it. Spectator conflict, that can be between spectators. 
that could be official to spectator, coach to spectator. Um, and then hostile sidelines in general, it could be the team, coaches, again, just when it comes to more of a group instead of individual. Now this perception, how we appraise the situation provides the information to our body and brain as to how we should respond. As I mentioned before, if we perceive something to be a threat, whether it is real or imagined, our body is doing the right thing by responding and saying, hey, we are trying to warn you that something may occur here. So we wanna make sure we're perceiving things appropriately so our body is not acting out of whack, so we're not feeling tension before we even communicate with that tough coach, that tough parent. Um, we wanna make sure we're perceiving it as a black and white situation instead of getting ourselves tied up into um, our feelings alongside their feelings. Um, our body's created to respond to this and recognizing and acknowledging that this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, if you never get stressed about anything, right, we, we want to make sure that we are recognizing where is our buy-in to this. The reason you might feel stressed in these situations is because you care about the product that, that you're putting out there. You care about the safety of others. You care about the safety of your officials if you're a field marshal, right? So making sure you recognize, hey, stress isn't bad. It's what can I do when I recognize it? So this is where we're at now is we've faced the stressor because it's inevitable. We have looked at that perception um, and appropriately started assessing, hey, this parent is mad because there was a bad call. They are acting inappropriately. I'm going to make sure that I recognize that I'm not stressed before I step into um, this next phase, which is probably going to be me interacting with them. So the two types of anxiety that you can feel um, and that stress in your body, somatic is going to be in our body. So tension, tunnel vision, butterflies, sweating. If you're a former athlete, you probably got this before a game sometimes, maybe the bigger the game. As an official, you might feel this before just a big match because it's important for you to do a good job. Again, not necessarily bad. We just wanna know how to utilize those physical symptoms um, in a positive way. And then cognitive anxiety, it's in our mind, increasing attention to negative thoughts. So catastrophizing, right? So you made a bad call, now they're angry. All of a sudden you might catastrophize to the point of they're going to wait for me in the parking lot, or I'm never gonna get put on a big game after blowing this call in the Sweet 16, right? Whatever that looks like, we might jump to a foregone conclusion that doesn't even exist yet. That's part of cognitive anxiety. And then it can also cause um, tunnel vision when we can't actually spend time recognizing out, outside factors, both um, physically and just picking up on cues when it comes to what's going on um, around us. And this is an attentional bias to whatever that we have perceived to be a threat. So why does this matter, right? You're like, I want to know how to deal with the escalating, not just what's in my body. In my opinion, it helps inform us before we step into those escalating situations. If we are feeling all of this and we're not acknowledging what's going on or practicing how to manage it prior, we are going to respond in a way that maybe our thinking isn't as clear, um, our response isn't well thought through, and at the end of the day, we're probably meeting frustration with more frustration, and we all know that that rarely solves or de-escalates the situation. Conflict is not going to be comfortable. How we can appropriately manage what's happening for us, um, we want to make sure that we are doing it because we know it'll help us later communicate in, in a more clear and concise way. When we get so physically overwhelmed with stress and that cognitive stress, if we go past that fight or flight mode, we actually get this emotional hijacking in our brain where language centers can shut down to where we can't articulate our thoughts and feelings. Maybe you've been around a player that like chokes in a big moment and they can't explain why. That's part of this emotional hijacking. You are not going to cognitively be able to think rationally when you are overwhelmed with your stress. So the first step in de-escalating is being really good at understanding how to psychologically distance yourself from the situation that's happening. You physically might have to be there, 
but making sure we understand our emotions don't have to be their emotions and their emotions definitely don't have to be ours in this situation. So those factors that we talked about, maybe they're badgering an official, refusing to leave a park when doing, when being asked to leave, right? That's a higher level escalation or verbal and hopefully not, but potentially physical altercation between spectators, officials, coaches, et cetera. The first, um, and some of these might be really specific to certain situations for you and others may be, oh, that wouldn't work in that situation. Pick and choose where you see some of these can apply because not all are gonna fit your specific um, demographic, your specific role. Um, these are options and again, like tools in your toolbox to where some things, these opportunities to work it out might work. And other times this might be something like, maybe at some point this will be appropriate, but right now this doesn't fit what we need. So just make sure you kind of take what matters to you and what resonates with you and kind of leave the rest in that way. Um, instead of thinking all of these have to be applicable to you. Because um, again, we don't want you feeling overwhelmed in how to apply these when you are in a tough situation. So the first option, listen, offer, and wait. The first thing I wanna say is listening and reflecting their feelings back to them does not mean you are agreeing with them. I understand behavior is when it's inappropriate, we want to make sure they know they're wrong. How can we, again, psychologically detach our feelings from the situation and know it's not about them knowing that I'm right. It's about the safety of others and the proper protocol. And then maybe I can get feedback from my colleagues to tell me I'm doing the right thing and attach my value and my ego to the people that matter instead of the parent, maybe someone screaming, um, or hopefully not a physical altercation. So the first, listen to what the issue is and the individual's concerns, right? Don't come in hot and just tell them to knock it off. And then offer reflective comments to show that you heard what their concerns are. It's not about saying, oh, you are absolutely right. That was a terrible call, right? Maybe we need to support um, an official if they made a bad call, or maybe we need to not even acknowledge that piece, but we don't want to immediately write them off as wrong because it immediately will fuel that fire of them trying to prove a point. If we talk about that stress cycle again, they might be past the point of somatic or cognitive anxiety. They might be past that point, and there's no going back when it comes to rational thinking. So for you, like, you don't want to meet that head on with a lot of stress. And then the third piece of wait, wait until the individual has released that frustration. Maybe you have to physically remove them, right? Maybe you have kids watching, maybe a game's still going on. Maybe you have a location. Do you have a formal complaint? Come with me, listen, offer a reflective comment. You believe this situation happened. I hear you and wait till they get all that frustration out. And then you can go on to whatever those next steps are within your protocol. And a reminder reflecting their concerns does not equal agreement. I don't want you to feel like this is me telling you to, the customer is always right them. We wanna make sure that you understand you are the subject matter experts, right? You're the officials, um, but we also know that when we get past a certain point of frustration, there's probably no getting to a resolution when it comes to agreement sometimes in these situations. So the second, just empathy and acknowledgement. Empathy does not equal agreement. So we want to recognize, validate, and acknowledge what is happening, and then also know that it does not excuse their behavior. So acknowledging the fact, like, I can empathize. Your kid had a really big game, and you feel as though it was robbed from him. However, the behaviors do not align with this park's rules and regulations, and you are not able to stay for the remainder of this game. I'm not gonna tell you, no, you were wrong. That call was completely called for, right, right? We don't, whether or not it is true, we can move past that. So let's validate and empathize. We wanna 
lie our, our place our empathy in the disappointment of the situation and then not in the way that they're exhibiting that behavior. This can go in with that um, reflect and wait as well, or this can just be separate of as simple as I, I can see why this is frustrating for you and you have to leave or and you cannot say that ever again, <laughs> right? Whatever your protocol is in that situation. And this is that, that piece, facilitate. Um, this goes after those two, according to your organization's protocol, offer solutions to the situation. The first is, there is a way to submit an official complaint and walk them through it, right? Don't just write them off. De-escalating a situation provides an open door to this person's voice to be heard. Now, maybe in your protocol, you can also submit something that, hey, this gentleman has filed an official complaint on this, on this official, and I want to make sure it is also documented what I saw and what I did. But offering that provides them a channel to put their energy instead of on you, instead of on the whole park, instead of back at that official or coach or other parents, oh, like hear them. And here is how we file that complaint. Scan that QR code and walk them through it if they need, if they need help. But a reminder, not all complaints are gonna have a solution. Whether or not they understand that is not your responsibility. Sometimes, Complainers don't even want a solution. You walking them through that is going to provide an open door to conflict resolution, even if it's just, just mitigating the energy that they're putting into the field, into the facility, versus you're not going to go back and replay that game, right? So how can we at least provide them a channel so it's just not getting broadcasted for every, everyone to hear. Reminder, this is where we're also thinking about how we're responding, which we'll talk about in just a second. We wanna to try to outsmart the escalation. So this is a really hard one to do, especially when you know you're right. Especially when you know this parent or coach just doesn't have a clue what they're talking about. You want to be authoritative, show them the rule book, tell them to stop yapping at you and send them on their way. But the way our psychological processes work, and if anyone's ever been on Twitter before, you know, no one ever calms down from someone meeting them head on with the same energy. So taking a less authoritative, less controlling, less confrontational approach, you may end up with more control. Again we have a way for you to voice your concerns. Let me walk you through this. This person feels as though they're in charge when in all reality, you're completely in control of the situation. We have a location where you can submit an official complaint on this, on this referee, come with me. You've now removed them from the situation, even though they feel they are the ones in charge. Again, this is not giving them the power or the permission or telling them that they're right. This is de-escalating that situation specifically and hopefully removing them from the area if it's what you need to do. Reminder that the goal is not to prove you are right or your colleague is right. The goal must be to de-escalate or remove if we need to, whenever possible. Um, they may, so the, the bottom part is why. Like, why should we do this? Why can't we just throw the rule book at them and, and tell them, that they're wrong and tell them to be quiet or they're out. This individual's normal coping measures are likely not working now. So now they're in that stress cycle and they have not exited with proper coping skills. They're, now you're the stressor, right? So we hit a stressor, bad call. We'll use that as an example. Or this parent said something about my kid and now I'm mad. That was the first stressor. We've gone around the circle and now you're the stressor because you're telling me that I'm wrong. You're not hearing me that I'm validated. You're telling me that I shouldn't have these feelings. So now that cycle is going to restart and that 
second cycle is always going to be a little bit higher when it comes to the level of stress, the level of tension, and less cognitive function. So in protecting yourself and your colleagues, you're also protecting them, right? At the end of the day, we want people to enjoy sports, and you are not going to educate them on the stress cycle, but you want to provide a way for onlookers to see how to navigate those things and again feel safer in your facility and I use the word safe even on the basic level of like enjoying sports right it doesn't always have to be physical safety it can be just the safety and comfort of watching sports. so here is a little activity um, that you can do either right now or as you're getting ready, maybe you have um, matches this weekend, as you're heading into summer, we want some preloaded scripts. This is going to make you feel like a broken record. You might feel like you're getting dumber by the minute if you are saying the same thing over and over and over again. But it protects you from getting baited into the fight. And it allows you to stay, as I've mentioned, psychologically distant from an outburst and getting into your own maladaptive, maladaptive cycle of frustration. So preload a few neutral responses based on situations you may enc encounter this season. You've probably encountered stressors before. Um, unfortunately, you have probably been harassed if you're an official or you've seen it happen or you've seen parents fight. Um, you've seen coaches create negative situations, both for players, officials, parents, so think of some of those situations and then think of a neutral, something that can give you space, repeatable phrase. So I can only make a call based on what I see. That is something obviously that you've probably all said to a coach who is livid about something that you missed. Maybe it, our officials can only make calls based on what they see. Or, I am the field marshal, I am not on your field. And they keep telling you what happens, I am the field marshal, I am not on your field. I did not, like, I can only make calls based on what I see, over and over and over again. The fact that, one, I know this might not de-escalate them, particularly in that moment, because they'll probably get even more frustrated, at least for a moment, your lack of buying in to the escalation forces their cycle to stop at some point because they're either going to escalate to the point where they have to leave or they know they're not going to get anywhere. Or the third piece is you offer one of those earlier de-escalation techniques of, can I show you where you can file a complaint? Or I understand and. I, I understand your frustration and the game is going to continue on as play. But your preloaded um, script allows you to almost put up this shield that doesn't, it protects you from them, but it protects you from you as well. Because at the end of a hard day, you want to be able to look your boss, your colleagues, or just on your drive home yourself in the mirror and go, I handled that in a way that I'm proud of versus snapping because you're probably already stressed because sports are stressful. We mentioned that. Or you might be stressed because it is a big game. And in general, maybe you did miss a call earlier. So finding a way to get that psychological distance is going to give you the freedom to see it in black and white instead of all this gray mixed in. And you might be able to not prove that you are right, but again, provide a channel for that energy to go somewhere else. And at the same time, not open the floodgates for yourself. Because while we want to de-escalate them, we want to also protect you from escalating the situation further. So let's talk stress regulation techniques. For you, for you as officials, for you as administrators, for those of you who have to deal with constant um, voices, whether it's yelling because they're just cheering, you're going to hear yelling all day long. And some of you may be able to block that noise out 
you may be able to recognize this has nothing to do with me, or maybe all of it can feel really overwhelming after one conflict and everything starts building one upon another. So the first, before conflict. Let's talk about the day before, the week before. We gotta sleep, right? If you are missing sleep, our cognitive function is going to decrease. Not only that, our physical ability to compete and do things at a high level are going to decrease. And as officials, if you are on the field, you might not be competing, but you're still performing. And we wanna make sure that you, you are physically performing at a good level. This will help minimize, hopefully, some of the um, situations that if you are overtired or you aren't hydrated or you're not uh, eating well, you may make more errors. So we wanna first just protect ourselves in that way. Let's sleep, let's hydrate, and let's eat. I say let's eat because we all know the, the Snickers commercial, you're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> You've got to make sure you're not cranky and responding to someone just because you didn't eat a good meal before your game or just because you didn't stop by the concession stand to get something when you know you aren't going to have time to eat in between these long days that you have. So it sounds silly, but pack snacks, pack drinks. If you don't have access to good quality snacks or foods, bring them with you. And then sleep. You can always preload sleep. Um, it's called sleep banking. And ahead of a long weekend, you can add 20, 30 minutes, 45 minutes each night ahead and bank those hours. So then you feel more well rested heading into a big Saturday tournament or maybe a multi day tournament. Or maybe you're on the road and you don't sleep well in the hotel. You can pre plan that by loading your sleep ahead of time on the day, pre-conflict. Let's pre-plan those situations and responses. So this is not about, oh, today's gonna be awful. I have to look over my shoulder every second. This is, who's playing? Man, that coach complains about everything. Let's walk through, maybe you are watching that field specifically, maybe you're the official on that field. What can we do to pre-plan if a situation occurs, because we don't want to feel caught off guard. There are certain things that we're going to feel caught off guard for, but those should be the high emergency issues. Those should not be parent conflicts, referee abuse, um, or coaches. Unfortunately, we should expect those from time to time. So let's pre-plan. This is as simple as the day before or the day of talking through maybe administration. Hey, we've got a really big game over on field two. We want to make sure we have an extra set of eyes there, um, a well-rested, well-fed, hydrated person, um, and just know that there may be some additional heat going on and anger or whatever, and we are going to decide, are we letting it play out or are we holding it tight early in the game, right? And so just talking through that allows your body and brain to go, huh, we planned for this instead of, oh, no, there's a threat, right? So it's just a very simple in your routine before you start your day or walk out onto the field, make sure you just kind of walk through that. You can do check-ins during the day as well. If it's a tournament style, you should pre-plan the closer we get to the bigger game. Planning ahead allows for calmer perception and response of the stressors because, again, like I said before, that stressor is probably going to occur. How can we manage it a little bit better and not act shocked when it happens? And then we can just really enjoy it if it doesn't. And then finally, I think this is really important for on the day. It is your job to know your organization's protocol, right? If you don't know where you can send someone to file a complaint, we need to ask that. Um, not of me. <laughs> you need to ask your administration that. You need to know, okay, in this situation, where do I walk them to? If we want to physically remove them without physically having to remove them, where can I walk them to show them how to file a complaint? Um, what is the protocol of once they put hands on someone, we have to call the authorities? What, what does that look like for you? Don't be asking your protocol while you are under stress and a big situation is occurring, right? It's the same thing. Um, I recently was living in Kansas. We knew our tornado protocol because we lived in Kansas. 
you should know your conflict protocol because you're in youth sports, you're in high school sports, you're in college sports. And unfortunately, that's just part of what we've signed up for these days. So mid-conflict, prior to engaging, let's take a deep breath. Now I can't see your faces, but if you'd like, you can practice deep breathing right now. The biggest piece is focusing on a longer exhale to decrease stress. So if you breathe in, big deep breath through the nose for four seconds, you want to exhale for six to eight seconds. That takes 12 seconds out of your day, and it brings your stress levels back to baseline. Your neurological systems, your physiological response is going to be better if we take that 10 to 15 seconds to take one deep breath before we engage. That is something that is in your control and easy to do. Second, utilize those preloaded scripts. Don't just think, oh, that was a great idea and not go through it. Have a few, have one. You can be the broken record person that says the same thing over and over again, but you never get baited and you're able to de-escalate a little better. And then finally, just because it's said does not make it true. Maybe you've been hearing all day how bad your officials are. Maybe you've been hearing all day how poorly run this facility is. Maybe it has been a rough day. But just because it's said doesn't make it, make it true. Just because a parent thinks you're the worst official that has ever walked the face of the earth, I, I'm sure there's someone worse out there, right? Just because it's said doesn't make it true. So that's that psychological distance that we're talking about, trying to remove ourselves from the situation where our feelings aren't involved. It's their kid that they feel was wrong. We don't have to buy into that feeling. They feel that this facility is out of hot dogs and how dare you be out of hot dogs, right? Like whatever it is that's making them mad, let's make sure we remember just because they're saying it, I don't have to attach my worth to that, my value to that, or even just my feelings that. Post-conflict, report according to your organization's protocols. Maybe a disgruntled parent, disgruntled coach, in the moment, you have free um, reign to make decisions when things are tough or stressful. Um, make sure you report it after. Um, and make sure you do it when it's fresh in your mind. Um, and then if there are changes you need to make later when you calm back down, have a conversation with someone and walk through it a little bit so you can know how to best articulate that situation. If you responded poorly, that is something that you both organizationally need to deal with, but also personally. How can we recognize, okay, when I felt this, I could have repeated a phrase that detached me from it. I could have called in a colleague to make sure I wasn't alone. I know a lot of times that might not be realistic in the way you're staffed. So just make sure you go through like a, the same as you would as an official going through, oh, we could have uh, made this different call or I could have gotten up the sideline a little faster to get better eyes on the situation. Maybe we just talk through that with a trusted colleague of, or maybe by yourself on your drive home. How did I respond? And what are the small ways pre-response that I noticed that I could maybe make a change? So when I wrote, go for a walk or a jog prior to returning to your game, if you are an official that has another game, we want to make sure you're not operating at an elevated cortisol level for the rest of the day, because now you might feel chippier. Maybe you responded great to this conflict, but you held it all in. We got to get it out. And so if you have physical stress, we want to match that with a physical stress relief. So power walk around that facility. Maybe just a few sprints to get it out. Some people might not have the ability to go and do that. So find a way to get it out of your system in an appropriate way before you return so you're not taking it out in your job. Deep breathing to return to baseline, what we just talked about. You can also Google box breathing, which allows you to kind of go um, in, pause, out, pause. And it takes a little more time, but it brings you back to your baseline as well especially if you're a field marshal or someone that isn't actively needing to be physically active, 
you can bring back to baseline so you're not stressed the rest of your day. And then finally, my most important stress relief tactic in conflict is socialization. This doesn't mean fraternization. This is just having connectedness. Post-conflict, having a colleague go, whew, that was crazy. That is a stress relief already. Acknowledgement of someone seeing it and being like, better you than me, man. Or, hey, you handled that way better than I could have. Or, hey, I was by myself in this situation. I just want to talk through this and get it out. Or, let's talk about a really good game that we just had that has nothing to do with this parent or the situation so we can get psyched about our job again. Just that social connection. One, socialization and connectedness is uh is part of and attached to motivation to do things at a high level. And so after you go through a conflict, you may not feel motivated to return to your job. And so making sure you find people who do want that connection with and for you is going to be really helpful in this situation. So here's a quick hit list. This is our last thing um, before we do a little question and answer. But this is for you. And this is something that you can utilize in sport, but you can also utilize it in other things. And this is just a really quick hit list of how to combat stressors. We are not going to avoid stressors. Yes, you can look at parts of your life where you can remove stressors. But if you're gonna be in officiating in management of sport in any capacity, there's gonna be stress, both good and bad. So the quick hit list, the first uh, is self-talk. How do you talk to yourself? before, during, and after tough situations. We want to make sure that you are not belittling yourself following a tough situation because at the end of the day, you're going to believe the voice you hear the most and the voice you hear the most is yours. So making sure if you didn't handle something well, acknowledge that and then recognize, well, this was a tough situation and here's how I know I can handle it in the future. Or did you see those, those calls I made earlier or the way I handled this tough situation in a positive way, making sure you're not adding to the critical voice that you may hear in the stands or from coaches. Visualization is honestly just creating the picture in your mind before, can I picture myself handling tough situations? Can I walk myself through being on the pitch and smelling the grass and hearing the cheers and being able to move on after a difficult situation. Visualization can also be picturing yourself not stressed out. Maybe it's not even having to do with soccer. Maybe it's before you get in your car and drive home. We want to make sure that you are utilizing your mind's eye to recognize that good things can happen or you can navigate tough things. I already mentioned social engagement. The reason sport is so great is because it brings people together. And unfortunately, it is tearing the most important people apart at the youth sport level and all the way up through um, the college and pro level, the officials and the people who make the game possible. So find your colleagues, find your comrades, find the people that you can just kick it with if you need to. Just connect with over a water before you head back out on the field, or maybe it's before a game, following a game, find a way to have um, connections so you're not isolated when tough moments arise. I mentioned breath work. Any other relaxation techniques, this would be post, right? So maybe you had a, a long day, maybe there was one big conflict, zero conflict, 10 conflict. If you're a open the windows and get fresh air. If you're a soothing music, lights down low. If you want to watch a movie and de-stress and, and detach, those things we want to intentionally choose to do instead of just zone out. So again, we can really recognize our body and our physiological systems coming back. Um, and then that sets us up for the next day to face an escalated person in a calmer way or at least have clear decision-making because we've um, been able to relax at the end of the day. Think sleep habit. This is Googleable, right? Like we can look at how to make our sleep habits better, but you should be attempting to take care of your sleep 
if you want to handle conflict better, if you want to handle tough people, if you want to be good at your job, if you want to make sure that you can navigate things quickly, both physically, but also mentally, we've got to get better sleep habits. This can be as simple as going to bed at a similar time every single night. Um, this could be increasing your overall sleep from six hours to six and a half, from six and a half to seven, right? It doesn't have to be, I sleep five hours and she wants me to sleep nine. These drastic changes are not realistic, really out of the gate. Um, it's sleeping in a dark room. Get blackout curtains. Don't let that sun wake you up. Make sure you are, maybe have a street light out your window. Put on those uh, blackout curtains. If you have them, try to have a darker space. Lower the temperature of your house. Keep it cooler. That's going to help you sleep better as well. And then finally, creating routines. You cannot just wing it. And I think you all know that if you are... <laughs> In sport, in any capacity, there has to be a plan. So for you, we want flexible routine when it comes to how we show up every day when we step out onto that field or we walk into the office. Maybe Monday mornings are rough after you've been a, um, in charge of a certain group of fields for the weekend. We want to make sure that you have created a pattern to not only navigate the stressors, but pre-plan how your day is going to go because this is where you fit in good sleep, good eating, good hydration. And then I know my protocols, especially for this work to where I'm not winging it in the moment and I'm not feeling caught off guard when things occur. But beyond that, I am feeling more in rhythm to where not only is my job in soccer going to get better, but maybe the way I relate to my coworkers, the way I relate to the people at home, it's just going to free flow a little bit more because I've intentionally created patterns in which I can live my life. So finally, that is all I have. And I am happy to stop sharing my screen so we can chat on whatever uh, questions we may have or anything that Marcus wants to discuss. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. If anybody has a question, please feel free to uh, click the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, and insert your question, and we will do our best to answer it. Um, going over some of your presentation there, I know the breath work and the sleep habits would make uh, our sleep expert, Dr. Amy Bender, very, very happy. Uh, she's a big advocate of the box breathing and uh, things along that lines when it comes to uh, getting better night's sleep and things along that lines. Uh, one thing I do want to bring up to uh, our folks that uh, we are going, we are recording this session, uh, which we're going to put it up on YouTube later, and then we'll get the uh, message out on our social media platform. So please, if somebody was unable to attend tonight due to various reasons, uh, please feel free to share this uh, YouTube video with them to be able to give them some ideas and some links and uh, just some tools for the toolbox so next time they're out at the fields. Um, one thing that we do have that we're going to be, uh, Mass Youth Soccer is going to be introducing uh, at our venue uh, for our state cup competitions uh, beginning on Saturday, uh, is we're trying out a new app called the Halo app, which basically is uh, a QR code that people will be able to scan and they will be able to uh, report an incident, whether that incident is, you know, hostile sideline, whether that is referee abuse whether that is something maybe wrong with the complex or, you know, one of the porta potties are out of toilet paper, you know, whatever the, the reason uh, may be, uh, they'll be able to re uh, report that to us. And it's an instant thing that's sent to uh, those that are in charge for state cup. Uh, we'll know about that. And um, you can include your name and information if you want into it. It could be anonymous. Uh, you can include uh, photographs and videos of the situation. Um, and it's just an opportunity for people to, we're trying to, you know, make things a little bit easier for those that if certain situations become a little bit uncomfortable and they need that extra assistance outside from our facility staff or our cup committee staff or anything along that lines that we can come and we can help out the situation and, and hopefully deescalate uh, that situation and uh, uh, provide some uh, value to our members as they come to state cup. So we're excited to, uh, to put that out there for uh, our state cup competitions uh, uh, beginning this Saturday. So if you're at our uh, location uh, at the SBLI fields at Progan Park uh, and you see something, uh, please uh, let us know about it and uh, we'll do our best to help you out in that situation. Um, I don't see any questions coming in, Christina. 
So I, I think you hit it. I think you hit it out of the park for <laughs> lack of a soccer Thank term. Uh, but uh, <laughs> like I said, we'll uh, we'll have all this information up on uh, YouTube uh, here within the next 24 hours. And please, uh, organizations, please share with your membership, share with your teams, uh, share with your administrators. Uh, some great information um, to uh, to uh, share with everybody. And hopefully we can manage things a little bit better, make things a little bit, hopefully a little bit easier for you when you're out at the fields, because we know how difficult they can be sometimes. Uh, Christina Kramer, mental performance coach, Kramer Performance Consulting. Thank you so much for uh, coming on for our webinar this evening. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm an original New Englander, so go Pat, go Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining us here tonight. Uh, we appreciate you being on our webinar. Have yourself a great evening.